Okay, hello everyone again and welcome to this masterclass. My name is Daria Frank and I'm a college lecturer in mathematics in Corpus Christi College. I'm also a director of studies in mathematics, so if you are going to apply to Corpus this coming here, then I will be one of the people interviewing you. So I have been in Cambridge for about 10 years now, and my research area is fluid mechanics with a particular focus on multi-phase turbulent jets and plumes. And that is what we are going to talk about today. So first of all, what is fluid mechanics? Fluid mechanics is a science of flows of liquids and gases. Formally speaking, if we divide mathematics into the pure and the applied area, then fluid mechanics is most certainly a subdiscipline of the applied mathematics. However, it is not the entire story. Fluid mechanics is a very multidisciplinary subject, so it can also be regarded as a part of the physical and engineering sciences, and there are even some contributions from chemistry and biology. So this means if we have a certain fluid mechanical problem, then it is often impossible to disentangle different aspects of the problem, and we must consider it in its entirety by taking into account all the contributions from the various disciplines. Now, fluid mechanics is also a very vast research area and it has several subdisciplines. Here on the left hand side of the slide, I listed some of those subdisciplines. So, for example, in aerodynamics, we study the air flows around an object, such as around an aircraft wing. Then, meteorology is a science of predicting the weather patterns. Oceanography uh, is the science of currents in oceans and seas. What else do we have here? So convection and advection. In convection and advection, we are looking at how flows transport heat and contaminants. Then we also have some biological flows that look at, for example, blood flow inside the human body. Then the granular flows study how, for example, the avalanches propagate or the sand dunes wander in deserts. And then also we can regard reacting flows and combustion also to be a part of the fluid mechanics. Now, this entire list is by no means exhaustive. It is also not mutually exclusive. So we can very well have a fluid mechanical problems that spans several disciplines here, and also very similar problems, very, very similar fluid mechanical problems may arise in the different areas of the fluid mechanics. Now here, on this right-hand side of the slide, you can see some typical problems that can be studied by means of the fluid mechanics. So for example, we can study how the avalanche, the snow avalanche propagates down the slope of a mountain. Here's a droplet bouncing of the water surface. Then here you can see a fire whirl which forms up the forest fire. And then uh, this one should be probably the most um, uh, the most um, is, is the image that you have seen most, which is a wave breaking in the ocean. Now, fluid mechanics has been one of the major research area in the Faculty of Mathematics in Cambridge for a very long time. In particular, we have a very large dedicated fluid mechanical laboratory on site, and it was founded in 1964. So this uh, virtual <coughs> laboratory was the first fluid mechanical laboratory associated with the mathematics department. So you may ask, why do we need a fluid mechanical laboratory in the mathematics department? So the answer to this is that the laboratory experiments are a very critical component in research in fluid mechanics. So by creating a carefully, defined, uh, carefully designed experiment, uh, we can find answers to questions that will help us to construct and develop theoretical and mathematical models, as well as to validate numerical simulations. Now, today we are going to take about multi-phase turbulent jets and plumes, and uh, let me just start uh, with, this, with explaining this sub-area of, sub of fluid mechanics. So generally speaking, a jet is a localized directed flow in the environment. And we call a jet a plume if it is arises or descends in the ambient due to its buoyancy. Additionally, we call it a multi-phase flow if the plume or jet contains additional secondary phases of liquids. So for example, oil droplets and gas bubbles in water or smoke particles and aerosols in air. 
So here you can see three typical images of a multi-phase turbulent jet and plume. So here's an ash cloud rising after volcanic eruption. Here are some factory chimneys polluting the environment by emitting some smoke. Or you can even produce a multi-phase jet yourself by using an aerosol spray in your bathroom. Now, multi-phase turbulent jets and plumes have been a very vast and research active area in fluid mechanics ever since the fundamental work by Morton, Teller, and Turner back in the 1950s. Now, the research program that I'm working on focuses on the study of multi-phase turbulent flow problems that are very important for protecting our environment and creating a clean, sustainable environment. So on the one hand, uh, we study the oil plumes and multi-phase plumes in general in oceans. And here we try to understand how we can control the contaminants transport in oceans and how we can mitigate the pollution. On the other hand, we study jets and plumes on a smaller residential scale and how they can be used in building ventilation in order to improve the indoor air quality and create a healthy and pleasant indoor environment for its occupants. And as I already mentioned before, in our research, we conduct laboratory small scale experiments, and then we use those experimental results in order to develop theoretical mathematical models and also to validate numerical simulations. Now, let me start discussing each of these areas separately. Many of you probably still remember this image that was all over the headlines of the newspapers around 12 years ago. This image shows the fire at, after the explosion at the Deepwater Horizon oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. As a result of this explosion, which took place on the 20th of April 2010, an oil plume was discharged into the ocean that persisted for a period of three months and released a huge amount of contaminants into the <laughs> ocean. So this was a multi-phase plume, which consisted of oil droplets and gas bubbles, and it was also released under very extreme conditions. So for example, it was released into the region of a very high pressure at about one mile depth. And it was also, it also featured very large and varying source points of fluxes that were larger than anything found in nature. And so you can think about a source point of flux as basically the amount of fall that is released into the ocean. As the plume was rising towards the water surface, it was affected by several factors, such as the ocean stratification. By stratification, I mean that the water density varies with the height. Uh, it was also affected by the ocean currents, and there were also two violent storms taking place during the duration of the oil spill. And last but not least, this oil plume was also released into the rotating environment due to the Earth's rotation. So the main scientific question which now arises is what was the resulting subsurface and surface pollutant distribution and what we can do in order to mitigate the consequences of the oil spill. So shortly after the oil leak was capped, a large scientific consortium for advanced research on transport of hydrocarbons in the environment was founded. And the main goal of this consortium is to try to understand and to predict the transport of hydrocarbons released in the environment in order to mitigate the consequences of oil spills and to get response efforts to potential future disasters. Now, this consortium consists of several universities, mainly in the United States, with several groups working on different parts of the project. So for example, we have a group that is looking on the seawater interaction and how the storms are affecting the spread of the oil on the ocean surface. Other groups are looking at what chemical processes are taking place underwater, so how fast the oil biodegrades and which um, how far how fast it sediments onto the ocean bottom. And then other groups are looking at how much oil is actually making it to the beaches and what we can do in order to mitigate this uh, pollution next to the beaches. And today we are going to look only on the uh, very small part of this project, namely on the buoyant plume dynamics next to the plume source. So I realize that many of you have no idea what a plume is and that you have probably not seen this mathematical theory before. So I would like to give you just a very brief and quick introduction of what we are talking here about. And I'll try to keep it as simple as possible and um, to avoid 
writing down any equations as much as possible. So basically, the, in the classical plume theory, you have a plume that is released from a point source at, at the bottom. So this fluid that is released at the source usually has a different density from the environment, such that the plume starts to rise towards the water surface. And as it rises towards the water surface, it can change fluid across the boundaries of the plume. And we can relate this, uh, we can relate this enchainment velocity of the plume to the central line velocity of the plume by means of some enchainment coefficient. Now, if we are doing so, we can now close the system of equations describing this plume motion, and we can come up with this system of differential equations for the different plume characteristics. So this one is basically the character, the conservation of the volume inside the plume. This equation describes the conservation of the momentum flux. This one is the conservation of the buoyancy flux. Now, this system of differential equations admits uh, different solutions depending on the ambient conditions into which the plume is released. So, for example, if you have a non-certified environment uh, where there is no density variation with a water height, then uh, we can come up uh, with a solution that tells us that the plume quantities for the plume width, the plume velocity, and the reduced gravity are scaling as these quantities here. I just would like to draw your attention here to the plume width, which basically tells us that the plume width is linear with the water depth or with the height, and this means that we expect a typical conical plume shape to appear. Now, if you have a stably certified environment for which the certification frequency is larger than zero, and so this means that the density of the ambient decreases with the water height, then the buoyancy flux inside the plume is described by means of this equation here. So you can see that it reduces. So it means that the initial source buoyancy flux of the plume eventually which reach, will reach zero. And once that happens, the plume will start to form a lateral intrusion. And by means of some dimensional considerations, we can conclude that the height at which the neutral level um, is reached and at which the uh, lateral intrusion forms is scaling like this quantity here. Now, if we additionally have some secondary phases inside the plume, then the oil droplets and gas bubbles, for example, can possess a so-called slip velocity. And this slip velocity means that those gas bubbles and oil droplets can escape the mean fluid flow, and they can, for example, escape from the lateral intrusions of the plume. Now, that was a very brief summary of uh, what we can expect to happen according to the classical plume theory, and I think it would be a, uh, it would be just good to see how those plume flows look like in reality, and I'm just going to point to you some features of the plume as we go along. So this one is a typical plume that is released into a non-stratified environment. So you can see again very clearly this conical plume shape, and then you can see that once the plume reaches the uh, water surface, it starts to form a lateral intrusion. Now, in the stratified environment, which is shown here, so we have the plume as it starts to rise towards the, uh, towards the water surface. Then at some point, it starts to form a lateral intrusion, which is very close, may, may be very close to the source. And because we have different bubbles and droplets that have the slip velocity, those start to escape from the lateral intrusion, start to rise towards the surface, and then they can find, they can start to form several secondary lateral intrusions. So this already offers a vast range of problems that we can study. So we can study at which point uh, we form the lateral intrusions, how much, how many contaminants will be remain trapped in will remain trapped in those lateral intrusions, and what happens uh, at the water surface here. But that is not the entire story because, for example, the depotarized oil plume was released into a rotating environment. So we conjecture that the Earth's rotation may have been important for the plume dynamics since the oil spill lasted for a very long period of time and for several rotation periods of the Earth. And the Earth's number is usually defined in terms of the, as, as the effects of the rotation are usually described in terms of this non dimensional Earth's number, which basically is defined as a time scale of rotation to the time scale of motion. Now, 
we studied the dynamics of the oil plume in rotating environment, and by doing so, we discovered, for example, a novel physical instability in the plume dynamics. So as you can see here, so this shows the view from the top, and this is the view from the side of the plume. As you can see here, in a rotating environment, the plume doesn't keep its vertical axis of propagation. Instead, it is laterally deflected after about one rotation period, and once it is laterally deflected, it starts to process into the anticyclonic direction. Okay, so what else can we study uh, on plumes, on multi-phase plumes in a rotating environment? So first of all, we can study the uh, pollutants distribution inside the water column, and we can see that here the uh, plume precession in the rotating environment dramatically changes the contaminant distribution compared to the non-rotating case. So these black lines show the typical plume shapes that would would be expected in the non-rotating case. And you can see that in the rotating environment, the lateral contaminant distribution is dramatically increased compared to the non-rotating case. And this, of course, has uh, very important and serious consequences for how we apply our mitigation measures and what we can do in order to reduce the spread of contaminants in the ocean. Okay, so I just to give you another example of what can happen in a rotating environment. So again, you have already seen this image showing the plume released into the non-rotating environment. And this one is the plume which is released into the rotating environment for very high rotation rate. You can see here that the plume shape and characteristics already changed dramatically. So we no longer have a conical shape. In, instead, the plume is bounded by almost vertical boundaries. There is uh, a very chaotic motion going on next to the source. And also we have a very interesting features at the plume front uh, that are basically the integration of the plume front in uh, different edges and a plume fingering that is occurring next to the rising plume front. Now in fluid mechanics, we would typically study this kind of problems and we will try to understand why the plume shape undergoes these changes, how we can describe them theoretically and whether we can predict where the contaminants will end up eventually. Just to give, uh, just to show you a couple of more videos here, that is a plume released into a stratified non-rotating environment. Again, so you can see those certain intrusions here, and this one shows a plume which is released into a stratified rotating environment. Again, you can see here that there are dramatic changes to the plume structure, as there are no longer lateral intrusions. Instead, there is kind of a wave which is propagating along the plume axis. So what we can try to study here is basically what is the wavelength of this wave, how fast it propagates, and again, how much, how many contaminants are reaching the water surface. So let's have, uh, in particular, a look at what happens at the water surface. So these two videos will show the uh, propagation of the contaminants on the water surface, so that is the top view of the plume. Here, for a very low rotation rate, you can see that the plume fluid starts to spread laterally, and there are some instabilities going on around the boundaries. However, the situation is changed dramatically, released, released the plume into a rotating environment. Uh, where the plume basically, there's very little plume fluid that reaches the surface. And we can see also the formation of different edges uh, that can move away very from, from the sort and found in completely unexpected places. Okay, so that would be also the typical kind of problems that we will study in fluid mechanics. Last but not least, I would like to draw your attention to a very curious phenomenon that also can occur for a plumularizing environment. So this one shows the formation of the Zoppel tornado-like plume. Yeah, so in some experiments and in some instances, we notice that the plume can be organized in a very strong coherent vortex and eventually form a tornado, uh, which also has a dramatic, dramatic impact on how the contaminants are transported inside the water column. Now, at the moment, we do know the conditions 
under which the tornado formation is favored. But uh, as far as we can see, it can still happen quite randomly. So at the moment, we have no idea how we can actually reliably control this tornado, from, uh, tornado formation. And that's a, the, that is a very hot research topic at the moment, while we try to understand how we can control the trigger this tornado formation. And if we can do this, then it would also have a very important consequences, for example, for understanding how the tornadoes are formed for atmospheric flows. And just, I would like to just finish off this section by just summarizing which kind of problems we can study for multi-phase plumes released into the ocean. So we basically try to characterize the plume structure depending on uh, different parameters, such as the water certification, the rotation rate, and the slip velocity of the bubbles. The ultimate goal of our studies, we would like to develop theoretical predictive models for the transport of contaminants in oceans. And one very important question is, what is the fraction of the contaminants remaining subsurface and how much contaminants, how many contaminants are reaching as the water surface? And this again can be coupled to existing chemical and biological models. So for example, the amount of time that the oil plume is spans underwater is directly correlated to the amount of time during which the chemical reactions they can take place and um, during which the oil can biodegrade. And last but not least, uh, and last but not least, uh, we can also couple the near source plume dynamics to a large scale oceanic circulation and develop some predictive tools on where we would expect the oil to end up at the end and on the which beaches we can see um, the contaminants from those oil spills. Okay, now we have talked about the multi-phase plumes as a contaminant source in oceans. However, just to switch the gears a little bit, a multi-phase plumes can also be used in order to actually reduce the pollution and the contaminants in oceans. So just to give you a very simple example here, so if you have a ship that goes through a ship log from a seawater area into the freshwater canal, then there is a certain amount of salt water intruding into the freshwater area. And this intrusion of salt water can be quite damaging for harbor areas and freshwater canals, especially since it would um, have negative consequences for agricultural and ecological zones, as well as it will pollute its drinking water reservoirs. So a big question is, what can we do in order to mitigate and to reduce this salt water intrusion into the freshwater zone? And this can be done, for example, by using the so-called bubble curtain. So the bubble curtain means that we produce some bubbles at the channel bottom. And as those bubbles rise towards the water surface, they form a bubble plume, and those create kind of a virtual barrier uh, between the salt water and the fresh water. So scientifically, we are going to ask how well does this bubble curtain perform? Can we describe the transport of salt water into the freshwater zone across this um, bubble virtual barrier and how much salt water is still intruding into the freshwater zone? And uh, this is one project that we finished last year and I had a very bright student working on this project. So we basically went down to the laboratory and uh, performed a very simple set of experiments. And by looking at this flow of this bubble curtain between a dense and a light fluid, we could identify the main features of the flow. And by using that, we could develop a predictive model on how much salt water intrudes from the salt water side into the fresh water side. And we found that if operated optimally, the bubble curtain uh, can be very effective in preventing the flow. So it basically reduces the intrusion of salt water up to 80% compared to the non-protective non, uh, case. So just to summarize what we are doing here, so we can control the transport of contaminants using the multi-phase plumes. And we can also, uh, what I'm not showing here, we can also use these multi-phase line plumes in order to flush out some certain polluted regions in the ocean. Okay, I think that's pretty much enough on multi-phase plumes in oceans. Let me let me just finish uh, with some more details on building insulation and on the role of multi-phase flows uh, flows in building insulation. Now, 
we became, we collectively became aware of the importance of a good building insulation about two years ago when the coronavirus pandemic started. And as you may remember, the first clusters of COVID-19 cases were all linked to confined indoor, very crowded and poorly ventilated spaces, such as the churches, cruise ships, restaurants, some food processing plants, prisons, or schools. And now, we understood quite quickly that we need to improve the ventilation of buildings in order to reduce the airborne, airborne um, transmission of diseases and uh, of the coronavirus. However, that is actually easier said than done um, because the prediction of the ventilation flows inside the building is very challenging. And just would like to give you a brief overview of the simple models that we can use here and discuss of what can actually go wrong and why it is not very easy to predict the ventilation flows inside the given building. The general speaking, we can divide the, the ways of the building ventilation into different uh, methods. So we have the mixing ventilation, which basically where basically the air and the new air introduced into the system and just mixes with the new air. So this ventilation method leads to a very homogeneous indoor environment where the entire air inside the inside the building is well mixed. And then on the other hand, we have the so-called displacement ventilation method, where we basically introduce the new air into the system and it deplaces, it deplaces the old air, uh, which is then extracted out of the building by some ways. Now, both of these ventilation methods have their advantages and disadvantages. I'm not going to discuss those today. I'm just going to say that given a certain scenario, either one or the other might be more preferable. And also, there are also different ways in order to achieve those uh, ventilation methods. So we can, for example, use the mechanical ventilation, such as the air conditioning systems and the fans, and those will mostly lead to the mixing ventilation inside the building. Also, another a very energy friendly way of ventilating the building is by means of the natural ventilation. And here, in natural ventilation, we make use of the existing floor patterns that are driven by the temperature differences or the wind in order to ventilate the indoor space in the building. And so a couple of examples here, so we can have the so-called buoyancy driven ventilation when there is a temperature difference between the inside of the building and the outside, and we introduce the cold air into the system through the low vent, it then displaces the hot air, which is then extracted from the building through a top level vent. Then we have a cross, cross flow of insulation when the wind is coming to the one window of the building and then it's flushing air through the other through the other window in the building. And then probably the most common way of ventilating the building is a so-called single-sided ventilation where I have just one opening on one side, one window, and the flow through this window can be either driven by wind or by the temperature differences between the inside and the outside. Now, how that now um, is it is it is it easy to predict this ventilation flows in a more complex building? Well, the answer is unfortunately no because there are all kinds of the complicating factors. So first of all, we have a very complicated geometry of the indoor space. The, we have different locations of the inlet and outlet vents. The location of these vents can be unknown. A given ventilation method may perform well under some circumstances and very poorly under other circumstances because we have weighing indoor and outdoor conditions. And then we have all those complicating factors in indoor and outdoor, such as weighing heat sources, there are people moving around, there is computer equipment, there is furniture. So it all makes the prediction of the ventilation flows inside the building very, very difficult. And to make the things even more complicated, the ventilation flows that we see inside the building are the so-called high Reynolds number turbulent flows, which means that it is also very difficult to run a numerical simulations and it's very time consuming to run uh, com computer simulations in order to predict those flows. Okay, so just to summarize this is that for a given building, it's very challenging to predict the flow patterns. It is also a very, a very um, active research area at the moment of how we can do this. So how, so how do the um, 
multi-phase flow, flows fit a multi-phase flow sphincter it loses well our cuff so, or our breath our excess breath is actually a multi-phase flow so our excess breath consists of a mixture of heat moisture uh, droplets and uh, maybe other particles and this exhaled multi-phase flow will eventually combine with the insulation flows and these contaminants will be distributed inside the indoor environment. So here you can see the typical histogram of the excess droplets that is taken from some previous studies. So basically, as you can see, the excess droplets are mostly in the microns range. And that is actually very problematic because uh, we can characterize these droplets uh, into the actual droplets that are larger than the 10 microns in size. And those are actually very nice ones because they have enough, they have enough buoyancy such that they fall down to the ground quite quickly. And that is where the two meters rule comes from. And so they basically removed from the air very, very quickly and don't pose a serious threat to the disease transmission. However, the much more problematic cases are the so-called aerosol droplets, uh, which are less than about 10 microns in size. And those are such small droplets that they can remain suspended in the air for a very, very long time and be transported by the ventilation floors and distributed inside the buildings, even between several floors and several rooms. And again, another very important question here is how do those excelled aerosols combine with the ventilation flows? And I just would like to finish my presentation by giving you two examples of what we can study here. So first of all, we can study how the exhaled breath of a person combines with the ventilation flows. So these three images shows that if a person exhales some air, then for example, the direction of this exhaled air can depend on the mode of speaking or breathing. So this one is directed downwards by just normal breathing. So if you start to talk, then you have a more horizontal propagation of the exhaled breath. And then if you wear a mask, then the situation, the situation is much more complicated. Now that is not the entire the entire story here because we as a humans are very hot objects so basically we have a body plume that rises above our heads and it, this body plume also modifies the ventilation flows and also this uh, heat plume that rises here it also interacts with the exhaled breath so if you wear a mask which is not properly fitting, so such as a simple surgical mask or a cloth mask, and then you're basically not protecting yourself from the inhaled air and you're not, so you're not protecting yourself from the inhaled air, so you're wearing it in order to redirect your exhaled breath, such that it's more directed towards the bottom, towards the ceiling, such that those exhaled flows can be more easily entrained into this rising hot body plume and be carried away towards the ceiling such that the contaminants are removed from the occupied space. So again, so this has been a very active research area for the past two years. And um, yeah, well, basically it's, it's clear that the contaminant distribution in a given building will depend a lot on the activity inside the building, the occupancy level, and also on the duration of the activity that is taking place in, in this building. Okay, and then I would like to finish this talk with giving you another example of how humans can, can um, contribute to spreading the airborne contaminants inside the indoor spaces. And so, for example, so we are usually not sitting just statically at our desks, so we are moving around. And if a person walks from a dirty air into a clean zone, then there is a wake propagating behind the person, such that the contaminants can be entrained into this wake of the person and be transported into the clean zone. Okay. And here, actually, we can come up with some clever solutions of how we can try to mitigate this transport of contaminants from the dirty zone into the clean one. Uh, this can be done, for example, by means of the so-called air curtain. So an air curtain is a high velocity plane turbulent jet that creates a virtual barrier between two zones. So they are usually used in doors of shops. So if you walk into a shop and feel the hot air coming from above, so that is a so-called air curtain. So the main goal of the air curtain is to separate the warm indoor environment for the 
from the cold outdoor environment for the purposes of the energy savings. However, an air cooling device can be also used in order to create a virtual barrier for dirt, dust, and particulates, and also from the insects. So how can we use this air curtain device in order to mitigate the transport of contaminants from a dirty zone into a clean zone? Well, we can just let this person walk through this air curtain. And as you will see in the video that I'm going to show you in a moment, so this air curtain will basically cut the wake of the person and um, reduce the contaminants transport from the dirt into the clean zone. So this is, for example, shown here. So we have a air curtain colored in blue, then we have a person which is modeled as a cylinder here, and then we have the air curtain which cuts the wake, and you can see that a large amount of contaminants is just staying into the dirty zone and doesn't make it into the clean zone. Okay, and uh, yeah, just to give you some quantitative, uh, quantitative results, so if operated correctly, the air curtain can reduce up to the half of the transport of contaminants from the dirty zone into the clean zone. So I think at this point I have talked for a long enough time and just would like to summarize of what we talked about today. So I hope that by this point I could convince you that the multi-phase flows are very common in the industry in nature. And it is very important to start and to understand the dynamics of multi-phase flows in order to control the contaminants transport and to create a clean and sustainable environment. And last but not least, this may have us usage air and the bay active research air, and there are lots of problems that we can still solve here. So at this point, I would like to end my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Daria. I mean, as a historian, that was all lost on me, but I trust that the budding mathematicians watching um, got, got something from that. Um, got a couple of questions that have come in uh, straight away. So the first one um, from Amir is, um, does the wave in a stratified rotating environment cause a current? Mm, yes, it does. The question is, which current is it? So that is basically, we have a current as a as the wave comes to the surface, but it's also there's some current inside the water column because the plume entrains fluid from, from the outside and also forms lateral intrusion. So we do have some lateral motion inside the inside the rotating environment as well, yes. Um, and then we also have one uh, from Adene um, and about uh, plumes in a marine environment or an ocean environment. Um, how would marine life affect the appearance of a plume? <laughs> Well, the marine life will not affect it, but it will, so basically it's not the marine life that affects the occurrence of the plume, it's just the other way around, so the plume would affect the occurrence of marine life, so for example, there are some bacteria populations, so, I'm, so that's not entirely my area, so that's more a question to the biology people, but as far as I understand, some bacteria are feeding on oil, so that is why the oil can also biodegrade, and for example, we could see a spike in the population of bacteria in the Gulf of Mexico after the oil spill was released into the ocean, and we could see this spike moving through the food chain, starting with the bacteria and then going on to, to, other, to other microorganisms as well. Um, this is from Hugo. Uh, does latitude affect the rotation of a plume in the ocean? Yes, absolutely. That's a very good question. So the latitude does affect the rotation because the relative, the, the relative rotation of the Earth uh, depends. So basically, so if you're, if you're staying on the Earth, the so relative background rotation uh, depends on the latitude of the Earth. Yes. So you will have the strongest, the strongest rotation Earth of the of the Earth towards the poles, and then it will decrease towards the uh, towards the equator. Yes. Um, and then uh, David asks, uh, thinking about um, uh, plumes in the in the atmosphere, does the surrounding air temperature affect the plume? Well, the surrounding air temperature, yes, it does. So basically, the temperature creates the stratification in the environment. So you know, you may remember from your physics lessons that the temperature is related to the density. And uh, that is why if you have temperature differences, then we have also the density differences in the environment. Yes, it does. Um, 
And now we've got one um, so it's from Eduardo. Uh, so who, and I suppose by which mathematician or mathematicians actually determined the mathematics within the behavior of plumes, such as the constants? Okay, <laughs> so that's a good question <laughs> because those constants are quite debated the bulbs are, I think, well, well, it's they're not quite the battle. So we have some new commonly accepted constants, but these constants might change depending on different uh, different situations. So, so you can have different uh, different uh, constants occurring in some very extreme and unusual cases. So I cited at the very beginning is this uh, fundamental work by Morton Turner from 1956. And that is basically, so that is the, Found fundamental works that laid down all the theoretical constants and basically all, um, all the classical theory of the plume. Uh, and then we've got actually a few three questions, uh, which I'll try and merge into one, which is essentially um, would plumes work in a vacuum space? And if so, how does that change what you've been talking about? Uh, no, not in a vacuum, well, in a vacuum space. I mean, so do you, do you mean like uh, without any, so plume, plume is a motion of fluid, yes? So if we say that vacuum is, is the absence of any fluid, so how can we have a plume fluid if we don't have a fluid? So that's, that's not going to work, I'm afraid. Okay, well, that was, sim that was simple enough, wasn't it? Um, so, uh, okay, so re in relation to the air temperature question, someone would like to know, that does the pH scale of ocean water affect the plume? Um, yes and no. So not the single phase plumes that are just with water. So the pH scale might affect the plume if you are actually producing bubbles. So the production of the bubbles, you know, for example, by means of electrolysis depends on the ambient pH value. So this means that you might end up with different bubble sizes if you have different pH values. And that means that you will have different slip velocities and that will, as a consequence, affect the plume dynamics. But it's not the primary, so that would not be the primary concern when we have studied plumes in the ocean. Uh, and then James asks a more general fluid dynamics uh, question. Um, why does pressure decrease as the velocity of fluid increases? Oh, that is something you will learn when you come to Cambridge. So, <laughs> so you're saying that, that James, actually, James, James has to wait for his answer. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, I'm, I, I try to explain this, but you will appreciate the answer to this, uh, to this question during the second year of your mathematics studies in Cambridge. So basically, pressure is, a, pressure is actually a, a form of energy of the fluid. Yeah, so you have like, so it can be linked to the internal energy of the fluid, but so is also the velocity, which is the kinetic energy. So in a sense, what we have is we have a conservation of energy here. So basically your pressure is converted. So your internal energy of the fluid is converted into your kinematic energy. And because, because you need to have conservation of energy, once the pressure decreases, you will need to increase your velocity. Okay. Um... So, uh, so this is from Amir. So, in an oil spill, would marine life increase the distribution of contaminants? And if so, how significant would marine life be to the distribution? Well, uh, we very much hope that the marine life is basically going to try to remove some contaminants for us. And then in a sense, we were very lucky that this oil spill happened in the Gulf of Mexico because there are some there were already some existing bacteria populations that feed on the oil in the Gulf of Mexico because there are some there are many natural oil seeps in the Gulf of Mexico. So we would have had a much larger problem if this oil spill happened somewhere different, for example, um, somewhere towards the North Poles. And well, the, the question, the answer to your question is: We hope that the marine life is that the marine life, so the bacteria especially, will help us to remove the consequences of the soil spill. Um, this is a question from Thomas: uh, Can subatomic particles such as neutrinos or photons demonstrate fluid mechanics behavior? We are going to talk about the relativistic fluid flows here. Uh, the question is yes, so we can have the relativistic fluid flows. 
Um, I'm not going to talk about it today. So that is an, enti an entirely different branch of the fluid mechanics, which is dealing with the relativistic fluid flows. Okay. But you can you can learn that in theoretical physics if you come to Cambridge and do part three, for example. Um, and then, so uh, uh, there's lots more questions coming, um, but we now have the undergraduates are, um, have just turned up. Um, so I just want to ask you one more um, question, actually. And it was the first question asked, which was, um, how did you choose what research area to specify in? Well, when the oil spill occurred in 2010, I was just finishing my studies in chemistry and doing my part three. And that is where I decided to look at the start to study those multi-phase turbulent plumes. And then I said, oh, that has a very huge implication actually for our environment. And that is what I want to do. So I want my research to have any impact on the environment. And that is why I ended up doing those multi-phase turbulent plumes.